Look, we're not gonna waste too much time. We're gonna get right into it, dog. I'm not I'm not ready for this one. I hate unsolved ish, cause it leave your head going. Like you be feel like you you and you be feeling like, man, I think I got the answer. Which <laughs> trip you out sometime. Cause the whole time you probably wrong anyway. I'll check out five of the creepiest unsolved mysteries by the homie uh Mr. Nightmare. I'll check out the rich video. Link will be in the description below. But let's go. <laughs> Kevin Wynn, who was 25 at the time, went missing in the early hours of December 9th, 2018. His family said he was kicked out of a bar called the Brass Rail on Broadway after an altercation, and that's the last they've seen or heard from him. Family, friends, and strangers have been hoping to find him or hear from him ever since. The following Sunday, nearly 150 volunteers and family members gathered at Lakeside Park to continue the search. The family searched the banks of the St. Joseph and St. Mary's Rivers, and also the area around the brass rail. The following Thursday, they found his glasses broken in the parking lot of the bar. Kevin's family stated that his vision was very bad and the fact that his glasses were broken and left behind was a very bad sign, and there's no way he'd be able to make his way around without seeing. Management at the bar told the family that Kevin had entered the bar four times the night he went missing. There's an Arby's down the road from the bar that had given the family two videos. They show Kevin walking by the restaurant alone, one around 1.40 in the morning, the other around 2.45 in the morning. The Brass Rail has given their surveillance video to detectives. But after two long years with no word, the family has become less hopeful. Many people Dang believe he had broken his glasses and without his vision simply stumbled into the river and drowned. But if this were the case, the body would have been found during the multiple searches of the river. Or at the very least, the body would have been washed up somewhere by now. We gonna stop after every story because y'all, I know y'all can talk too much. He he could have done that, but Pete, bro, said he came out. Him coming out the bar in and out four times that, that don't really say much. I don't know if you ever been to bars where when you drunk sometimes you you in and out, woo woo woo, because you need air sometimes. But if his glasses would have broke right there in the parking lot, I'm quite sure he pro quite sure he probably would have went back in the bar because like they say his vision was really bad. Like like bruh. I don't know. I think what I'm thinking, a little conspiracy mode. He he could have. Something could happen. Could have slipped in the water. I think something happened in the parking lot. Glasses broke right there. Mm. At least the body would have been washed up somewhere by now. In 2002. Michaela Lawrence, who was 12 at the time, and her entire family mm -mm. received news that her father had been in a fatal car accident. His body was barely recognizable from the wreck. The family, of course, opted for a closed casket funeral. Damn. A few weeks after the funeral, things started appearing in the mailbox of the Lawrence household. Small packages with Michaela's name written on them. The packages would come once every few weeks. The first package was a small knick-knack type item. It was a decorative model glow-up Big Ben clock statue. It was a familiar piece that Michaela's mother recognized from the house somewhere. A few weeks later, another package from came. From the house? This package contained an old antique stopwatch from the 50s. It didn't work anymore, but once again, it looked familiar to Michaela's mother. None of the packages said who they were from or where they came from. A few more weeks later, on Michaela's 13th birthday, a card in an envelope ended up in the mailbox, and written on it was Michaela's name again. The card was a happy birthday card. But once again, the mother recognized this card and the handwriting was familiar. It was the handwriting of her thought to be deceased husband. Stop it was playing a card with me, dog! The couple had given to their daughter years ago, and it was signed Love Mom and Dad. This confirmed her suspicions that the items that had been arriving in the mail were possessions from the house, those of her husband's. She tried to check the safe in the bedroom closet to see if anything was missing, but mysteriously, the safe combination no longer seemed to work no matter how many times she tried. She tried going to the police about the packages at her house. I'm going the out the first time. Anything except Stop advise to install some kind of security system. To this day, it's not known who sent the packages or how whoever sent them got a hold of them. This is why I hate unsolved. I was I was ready for I was waiting for the damn answer, dog. Ain't no damn answer, boy. It's unsolved. Cause at first, I'm like maybe the daughter just sending them to herself. I don't know. Trying to. Reminiscent of, of, of the father. But I'm like, at 12, at least I don't think I was doing that. At 12, I don't think I was like smart enough to do that. But 
I wasn't dumb neither. Chill out. After the first time I get a package to my house and my kid named Dog, stop playing with me. There's gonna be cameras all up. Or how whoever sent them got a hold of them. Frauke Leaves disappeared on June 20th, 2006 from the town Paderborn in Germany. Her body was found almost four months later, on October 4th, 2006. The circumstances of her disappearance are mysterious, especially since she's believed to have made contact with her friends between her disappearance and her death. 2006 was the year of the Football World Cup in Germany. Frauke met with some friends at the Old Triangle Irish Pub in downtown Paderborn to watch some of the games. Her mom dropped her off at the pub around 9 p.m. During the Sweden-England match, she exchanged text messages with an acquaintance until the battery of her cell phone ran out. She then borrowed the battery of her friend, but the friend said that she returned the battery before leaving. At about 11 p.m., Frauke left the bar. It's assumed that she walked home because mm. she was said to only have about 5 euro on her at that point. Her flat was about one mile away from the pub. Nobody knows which path she took because nobody saw her after she left the pub. Her flatmate Chris claimed that she never arrived in the flat. At 12.49 a.m., her roommate received a text from Frauke, which stated that she'd be back late. She did not appear Cap. at work the following day. And Cap, nigga, somebody sent that from her phone, dog. Hey, lower your tone. When you, when you come up in here, like, for real, lower, lower your tone a little bit. You too loud. We be chilling over here, for real, chill out. Boom, oh, fuck. Get okay, up. which stated that she'd be Crazy. back late. She did not appear at work the following day, and after she was not in the apartment, Frauke's mother reported her missing. Over the next few days, Frauke contacted her roommate five times over cell phone. The calls were usually short and during the evening hours and did not contain a lot of information about her situation. In the first calls, she hinted that she would come back soon, but answered further questions evasively or mysteriously. Mm -hmm, like somebody who The last phone call was received on the evening of June 27th, while Frauke's sister was present. Frauke got asked by her sister if she was held against her will, and she supposedly said yes, but then immediately corrected herself by saying no in a louder tone. What the hell? After that, the contact of Frauke was lost. According to police, during these phone calls, Frauke's cell phone was in various industrial zones of Paderborn, the police also assumed that the calls were placed from within a car that was driven to those areas. The case was never solved. Jack that one crazy, dog man. You you being held against your will and talking. You talking to your people that you know will be able to help you, but you can't even really say help. And you know if you do, even if you do, boom, he gonna end the call and probably do what he, he or she gonna do anyway. So it's like I'm screwed. Mm. That's why they always say when you, if if you get you know what like you you gotta you gotta be reacting asap. At that point, if I'm there, I know and I know you got me. And I know it's a GG. If I'm there, I'm I'm a hurry. Like what I can say, I'ma say. I'm like yeah. Does he got an afro? <laughs> oh no, oh no, he got an afro. First thing I can think of, I don't know. I'm just trying to. Remember. I would. You gotta say something that's legit gonna help you. Don't don't just say you got an afro because the hell of people got afros. <laughs> I'm looking for somebody from the '80s. Stop playing. But look, I'm, don't take no advice from me. Stop playing. That's crazy, dog. Jack Wheeler held many important positions throughout his lifetime. He was a chairman for the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund, a senior planner for Amtrak, an official of the Securities and Exchange Commission, and more. His value to his community made it much worse when Jack disappeared on December 28, 2010, after exiting an Amtrak near Wilmington, Delaware. He was later seen on December 30th at 10th and Orange Street in Wilmington. On December 31st, his body was discovered by a landfill worker as Damn. it fell onto a trash heap in the Cherry Island landfill. His death was later ruled a homicide. Mm -hmm. His death was ruled to be due to assault and blunt force trauma. It was determined that all the stops the garbage truck had made that day involved large commercial disposal bins in Newark, a few miles from Jack's home. Prior to Jack's death, he was sighted several times. On December 29th, he was sighted at the Newcastle County Courthouse parking garage. He was disoriented and wearing only one shoe. He tried to gain what? access to the garage on foot, claiming that he wanted to warm up before paying the parking fee. 
He told the attendant that his briefcase had been stolen, and he kept claiming that he wasn't intoxicated, but the attendant didn't believe him. It was later determined that his car was in a different garage. This was the last CCTV footage taken of him. Later that day, Jack asked a pharmacist in Newcastle for a ride to Wilmington. He reportedly looked upset at the time. The pharmacist offered to call him a cab. That's right, you ain't getting this the car. Store. <laughs> no disrespect, rest in peace, but at the time, I, you got a one shoe boy, and I know you, 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 yeah, they ain't drunk, and ain't no weed neither. I don't know what it is. Hell no, I'm late for work. <laughs> I used to use that excuse all the time. People, people, hey, low key, that's kind of rude. You kind of rude for asking people for rides, dog, if you don't know me. That's weird. That happened to me twice in Arizona. Why I'd be I'd be so quick on it too. I like the first time I was like, I was like, bro, I'm hella late for work. I can't do my base. Like, all right, never mind. One dude asked me, bro. I was like, oh, I was like, uh, which way you going? He is like, oh, I gotta go there. I was like, damn, bro, I'm late for work and I'm actually going on that way. I was like, bro, my bad. <laughs> I'm capping like you're not about to get in this car. Stop playing with me. I don't know you. So for a ride to Wilmington, he reportedly looked upset at the time. The pharmacist offered to call him a cab. He then left the store. On December 30th, he was seen wandering around various office buildings. Several people asked if he needed help, but he refused any assistance. This case has still never been solved. Damn, this one creepy, dog. Hey, the Kanika one is really creepy too. I don't know if y'all know that one, but this one is hella creepy because I don't know if someone slipped him something. I don't know. I don't think that's alcohol. I don't. It could be. But something could have happened, like someone could have saw him like wasted like that and took advantage of him and robbed him and killed him because people do that. Or something could have happened where he slipped up and did something wrong and caught. I don't know. That man. I hate unsolved ones, dog. This case has still never been solved. Damn. Lastly, we have the disappearance of Brian Schaefer. In 2006, Ohio State student Brian Schaefer went into a bar and never came out. He was out what? with two friends one night and they went to a bar called the Ugly Tuna Saluna. This bar had a front main entrance and a back entrance for staff and entertainment, both of which had cameras pointed at them. Around 10 p.m. that night, Brian called his girlfriend to tell her that he loved her. Soon after, Brian is seen on camera entering the bar and then later seen stepping out of the bar to talk to two girls before going back inside. Minutes before the bar closed and they were preparing to leave, Brian told his friends he was going to talk to the band. Brian walked away out of sight and his friends waited for him, but he was never seen again. This was not a large bar and the band does not remember talking to him. Ooh, On top no of it, sir. the cameras never caught him exiting the bar. No one knows what happened to Brian after he walked away from his friends or how he left the bar, or if he ever did for that matter. An FBI agent who was specialized in facial recognition spent a long time analyzing the security footage of the bar and watched every person who came in and out of the venue. He never identified Brian leaving. But years later, after he had stopped working on the case, he was at an Ohio State football game he bump and saw bro. someone across the crowd that he couldn't help but think looked very much like Brian. In fact, he bore such a resemblance to Brian that the agent had to go and talk to him. It turned out it was Brian's brother. Oh shit! Just how good he is. <laughs> you got my <laughs> boy with a long face on your ass. I was ready, boy. I think my say it was Brian. It was Brian's brother. <laughs> Oh, fuck this nigga. <laughs> Mom was right. Oh, gosh. That's crazy. Hold up. But his brother looked just like him. Like a oh, my gosh. This is about to get creepy, ain't it? What if he owed somebody some money? So he walked something he wanted to borrow? I don't know. And you know they be having like the little apartments. I look. I'm, I'm watching too many movies in my head right now. You know they be having the underground interest and shit. Like, you owe me my money. Like, I ain't got it. And then he just, they, they I don't know. Some mafia type ish. I don't know, dog help but think looked very much like Brian. In fact, he bore such a resemblance to Brian that the agent had to go and talk to him. It turned out it was Brian's brother, proving just how good the agent's facial recognition that ability is true. Were. Brian's girlfriend called his cell phone every day for weeks, and it always went straight to voicemail until one night when it actually rang three times, then went to voicemail. This was unexplainable. The truly weirdest part about this whole thing is that the last footage of Brian was him re-entering the bar. No footage was ever See? found of him leaving the bar, which has led to theories that he never did leave. See? To Told this day, you. no one knows where he is. Damn.
Damn, Mr. Nightmare, this one was good as hell. I'm telling you, look, I be low key joking, but I be serious sometimes too, dog. He got a twin look just like him, though. Mm. So what, he go in, boom. He said he was going. He said he, he he called his girl like I love you. If he was drunk, it'd make sense why he did that. If he wasn't, I'm not gonna cap. Most dudes don't just do that. Girls do that a lot. Y'all look more emotional. No, no offense. But for him to say that, it was like he knew. Like, and then he told he told his partner, he told them girls like, I'm about to go talk to the band. Band the whole time they like we ain't talked to bro. They they could be capping. We don't know. He but it it feels like it seemed like he knew something was about to happen though. I'm taking dog, people be giving you clues. He called his girl. He he legit told them he about to talk to the band. He cause he probably knew, like, they gonna tell the police, like, yeah, he told us something to the band, but if he know, like, bruh, I don't know the band, and I know for sure if I say that, they gonna be like, bro, we don't know him. I just like this one of them signs, like people leave, like, yeah, I'm gonna talk to the band. So that way when they that way when they say something, he they know, like, well shit, the band don't know him, so that's something weird right there. And he never came back out. And he calls the girl told I love him. Mm -hmm. If he never came out, I mean, you would think that's some type of law. If bro walked into your place and footage is showing legit, someone never ex never left. Low key, that means they still in there. So we about to figure out what's going on. You about to help, or you about to be, you about to get charged for kidnapping? I don't know. I just wonder if places should do that because it's like. No, but you can't do that. That's a little extreme. I'm capping. Because it's like, bro, ain't my fault. Cameras mess up. Shit, we didn't see this nigga leave. I don't know, bro. I just work here. <laughs> I'm ready to go home. <laughs>